Today we celebrate the Korean martyrs, Andrew Kim Taegong, Paul Chong Hasong, and their companions. And they were a part of the persecutions in Korea that were stirred up in 1839, 1846, 1866, and 1876. John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II, canonized them in, in one big group. And there is a whole list. We only hear two of the names today. But a whole list of lay men and women, of catechists, of priests and religious that are among those who were martyred. We know what great witness it is. It says in scripture, Jesus says that one has no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And we see that as one witnesses to Christ, that there is great love in that. That if one is willing to continue to love one's enemies, even as one is being killed, right? And if one is willing to stay and experience that kind of martyrdom, well, that that's a great love. And and that the Lord calls some people to that as a particular grace, as a particular witness. Obviously, not everybody is called to that, but this is, in fact, one way in which the Lord does call us to witness, to lay down our lives in the midst of persecution. We know from Scripture, of course, that um, if these folks did not have love already in them, then their laying down of their lives wouldn't amount to much. Because we hear St. Paul say that, right? If he were to give over his body that he may boast but have no love, it is worth nothing, he says. So we know that the Christian martyrdom is a particular martyrdom that is one of love, not of just simply foolhardy, rushing out, saying, well, this is the only way I'm going to get to heaven is if I die for the faith, kind of a thing. We hear in the scriptures, in the gospel today, something that is a little bit of a situation where it's kind of something that might have us scratch our head. Jesus says that this woman loves much because she's been forgiven much. But if we go back to the Dewey Rames translation, that is the the English that came from the Vulgate, He says that she has been forgiven much because she loved much. If we go to a literal interpretation of the the Greek, it also says the same thing. She's been forgiven much because she has loved much. That's where part of us might go, well, wait a minute, hold on. Hold on a second. Are we saying that she earned forgiveness? Yes or no? No, right? No, because Jesus forgives, right? And if somebody is repentant, they receive that. But the healing of sin, we as Catholics have always believed, and it's in our catechism, that the healing of small sins or venial sins can take place not only through the sacraments, but also specifically through acts of love. That love covers a multitude of sins. We've, this is an expression that we use, right? Right. Sometimes we forget this, by the way. And I will counsel people, especially in confession, when I can tell that they have been weighing up their conscience, when there's this huge burden on their conscience over venial sins. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't be sorry for venial sin. That's not what I'm saying. We should be sorry for venial sin, but sometimes there's this thing of like, such a psychological burden as if they're not forgiven until they confess it. Well, this is not our theology as Catholics. If we are going to go to confession without needing to, that is, if we're going to go to confession without confessing a mortal sin, where it would be absolutely necessary to go to confession, right? Okay. If we're going to confession simply to confess our venial sins, we're doing so for the grace of being able to overcome those venial sins. But if we've gone to communion, we've been forgiven them already. This is what our catechism tells us. Because we can't receive Jesus without him obliterating all of our venial sins. We're told quite clearly, though, if we're conscious of mortal sin, we're not two, conf- we're not two to come to communion, right? We're first to go confess, Right? But this goes to show something. The church has believed that acts of love can, in fact, 
begin to repair venial sin. Now, in this in the scripture, we hear that this is a sinful woman. We don't know precisely what the sin is, but there's kind of like a, a hint at it, if you would. But we know in our theology that, number one, that for a sin to be mortal, it has to be grave. We have to do it, that is, knowing that it's grave, knowing that it, that it is that serious of a sin, and we, we have to choose it with complete freedom, Right? So you can imagine a, a situation where maybe somebody has been abused most of their life, right? And where the only way they can experience any kind of love would be to sell themselves, right? And where the person maybe begins to do this without realizing how wrong it is. In which case, if they're ignorant of how wrong it is, even though they should know, but if they're ignorant of how wrong it is, though it's grave, it's not mortal. So here we see a situation of a woman, quote-unquote a sinful woman. We can imagine, just imagine that she's a prostitute, okay? But if she didn't know any better, there is that, that ignorance that mitigates her sin. In which case, the Lord is literally telling her that her sins are forgiven because of the love that she's showing him. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? It gives us, too, a lot of great hope, too. You know, the Lord, again and again, considers our intention, considers our disposition for things. He considers what's going on within us. He knows what might lead us to particular things. And we might kind of hold things against ourselves because of how we acted in the past or we might we might even be tempted to judge other people by how they're acting but we don't really know the lord may be able to say to the person your sins are forgiven they're 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 venial as compared to being necessarily mortal even if they were grave One thing we want to take up in this is, very simply put, the exercise of acts of love. The exercise of acts of love. If we see that we, we slip in small areas during the day, it says that the just person, in Scripture it says the just person sins seven times a day, right? Well, what does the just person do? The just person also repents seven times a day, right? If not more. And then to, then to realize, okay, if I was not just tempted to speak against this person, but actually did so, let me stop and bless the person instead to cover it. To let love cover the multitude of sins. This gives us a lot of great hope. It, it shows us that when we do these acts of love, they can begin to repair our sins. Even the venial sins. This is good news. Then that way we know we are participating with the Lord in releasing love. And when we come to communion, we'll know that, yes, the venial sins have been forgiven. But also that they've been repaired. We've repaired them with the help of the Lord. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't left us, right? Again, I'm not talking about situations where somebody's in mortal sin. Okay? Okay? Besides that, we can then also offer acts of love for other people's sins. Right? Hence the whole idea of reparation. And is that not something that not only we should be doing, but also other people in the church, especially those who are under the most scrutiny today, should be doing? I'd like them all to go on the Camino de Santiago, like without cars or luxury, but that's another story. Talking about the bishops, but anyway, <laughs> the the ones that we know were 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 weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, they should be made to maybe do some penance too, not just not just be brought under scrutiny. Mm-hmm. So anyway, today we we look at the example of the martyrs who gave their lives out of love for others and for Christ, and we ask the Lord to inspire us 
with acts of love in our daily lives as witness, not necessarily the martyrdom of shedding our blood, but what they call the dry martyrdom of witnessing to love here so that we can also begin to release the life and the reparation for sin through our small acts of love.